Welcome to the Masters of Metrics podcast, helping you get more out of your digital marketing investment. This podcast is proudly hosted by Digivisor, a platform for people who want to grow their business by taking a data-driven approach. Now, here's your host, Emma LaRusso. So, Neil Schaefer, welcome to Masters of Metrics. It's great to have you on the show coming all the way from Irvine, California to us in Sydney here now. We just had a chat just a bit earlier, but your early career was based in Asia and in Japan in particular. Do you want to just give an outline of your career, how you started in marketing? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, born and raised here in the United States, but I grew up in a part of Southern California where most of all of my friends were Asian American. So that started me on this journey to learn Chinese in university doing a junior year abroad in Beijing, China, actually doing a summer in, in uh, Taiwan and in Taichung. And then my senior year, switching gears to Japan, learning Japanese, and then starting my career in, in Japan. And then two years into it in Singapore for six months, I was in uh, Chai Chi Industrial Park, for those that are familiar, and uh, had a great experience working with Singaporeans and trying to help this Japanese semiconductor company. I was always involved in high technology, so really better serve their American, European and Japanese customers in Singapore and, and in that area. And that shifted to helping our company now start a, a started with joint venture discussions uh, in Shanghai, ended up being a foreign equity owned factory in Dalian in uh, the Northeast uh, China, and then launching our sales operations. My background is actually more sales, more B2B sales than marketing, but launching our sales operations for the semiconductor company, beginning with Shanghai, and then moving into Beijing, the factory in Dalian, even uh, opening an office in Tianjin because Motorola was a key client and they had a huge factory there that we we serviced and did very well there. That role, beginning with the semiconductor company in China, turned into a role launching a Western Japan sales office for an embedded software company, which ended up becoming part of Intel, which led to becoming a VP of Asia sales for a new software company based out of uh, Ottawa, Canada startup. And in each of these roles, I was basically a country manager and I was in charge of sales, but there were a lot of things that we had to do in order to drive sales. So as part of lead generation, there was a lot of marketing we did. Uh, whether it was, you know, we, we launched our first website in China or creating, you know, uh, materials, trade shows are still really big in Asia, especially in Japan, that that person to person in China as well is so important. So, uh, you know, trade shows. And really what I found was with all the companies I was working for, the way that the, you know, the internal PowerPoints or what have you were laid out did not have good market fit. They didn't fit like local culture or, you know, the differences between Japan, China, and Korea and, and the way they do business and the needs of, of the manufacturers that were very, very different. So we ended up localizing a lot of stuff and basically doing local productization, local marketing, local customer support. So that experience gave me this extremely holistic business experience that when I came back to the United States uh, and I, you know, ended up launching this career, or consulting other companies in social media, that experience I had in Asia even though I wasn't, marketing to me was not where I came from. I came, like I said, more from the sales side. It was a natural extension and it was very much metrics and results driven. And I think that sort of approach, you know, companies really enjoyed that because in the early days, social media was run by a lot of PR departments and there's nothing wrong with that. But the way that they measured things were very, very different than someone who's used to living by their, their quarter's worth of sales and managing their pipeline. Uh, it's, it's a very, very different mindset. So I, I took that mindset and yeah, I've been doing this for now 11 years. I've written four books, uh, two books on LinkedIn, one on social media marketing strategy. My most recent is uh, this book called The Age of Influence, which is about influencer marketing, which I know is part of a Digivisor's product. Exciting to see that. And I'm actually working on my next book, which is going to become more of a, a a digital marketing playbook for this post coronavirus world that we're going to live in. But uh, yeah, everything I've done, you know, since then helping a lot of clients as a fractional CMO writing, a lot of speaking, I teach uh, executives at a few universities. I actually teach in Ireland every year, never had a chance to get down to Australia one of these days. Uh, but every time I meet someone from Australia, you know, be from Southern California, there's a natural similarity in, in personality and culture and lifestyle that I feel. So I think I'll be at home there. Uh, we'd love to, we'd love to host you here as well. Uh, I'm just curious, this, you know, from the country manager sales background, obviously you had that localization perspective of it needed to to truly resonate with the market. You talked about market fit. How did that go to social media consulting? Like, was that like what was that kind of shift for you that that was the area to focus on? It's not something I was looking for. So my background, like I said, was director VP. Asia sales, Asia biz dev, high technology markets. And it was in 2008 that I had my last corporate job. The first time I was hired in the United States 
for this job. And it was going to be exactly that. It was selling a network management system software to satellite operators, uh, cable providers. And what happened was the day before this one month trip to meet with all these executives of all of our potential clients that I had built up, they decided to, they did this huge corporate restructuring. They pulled the plug in corporate marketing and the CEO got fired and they said, Neil, sorry, but we're not going to do international sales anymore. So, and I just started three and a half months earlier. So at that time, what I had started doing was right when I got the job actually is when I launched my own blog, I'd gotten very active on LinkedIn and I was doing a lot of networking locally. And I saw LinkedIn as a business tool, which a lot of people back in 2008 really didn't see it as I I'd started this blog. I lost the job and it actually helped me to blog more. I had more free time. And my wife said, Neil, you should consider writing a book. And it's like, I don't want to write a book. But I, I said, you know, I, there were some opportunities that came and went, but this is 2008, 2009, our last great recession, where it was really hard to find a job. But also if I wanted to raise a family in the United States, we had at the time, three-year-old and one-year-old, I sort of had to reinvent myself because companies were going to hire people locally for Asia, not going to hire an American mm -hmm. to go there once or, or two weeks out of, out of the month. So it was really, you know, looking back at it, it was a natural thing that as I got involved and as I ended up publishing this book on LinkedIn, it led to speaking opportunities. And literally three months after publication, it led to consulting opportunities. And because my background was in B2B sales, I don't have an agency background. And I thought that what companies needed, because they didn't know what they didn't know, I felt that what they needed was they needed strategy and they needed education. And that was really the forefront. I, I did not want to be an agency and I'm not an agency today, but really helping companies from that perspective, I, I feel that it has to be their voice. It has to come from them. There's a lot of things that I can help them do, but at the end of the day, they really have to own it but mm -hmm. I wanted to help them find the right strategy, help them build out what a structure might look like, how to measure it, how to measure ROI, how to invest in it, how to train people in it and, and be there together for a long-term relationship. So that's something that in 2013, I wrote Maximize Your Social, all about all of this consulting that I had done since then. And now I say I do more of like a fractional CMO type of role with, with several companies on different projects where they need you know marketing expertise. But yeah, I really enjoy the consulting and, and helping companies as if I'm on the team, right? I really enjoy that. And I've always been results driven. So I know when I meet with executive leaders, they love the fact that there's someone in marketing that's results driven and just, you know, aligning uh, my, my approach to strategy is just align. What are your corporate objectives? What can we do in marketing to help you meet those? Where do we make smart investments? How do we align what we do? And, and how do we measure and show that there's tremendous ROI in doing this if we do it right? And that's really what keeps me going every day. <laughs> I can think of 2008, 2009, we founded, I founded Digivisor in 2010, and this was still very early, right? Using the digital Indeed. platforms, but it was all about creating the person to person connection. Cause that's why people were connecting and people were sharing more if a person shared it than a brand. So you were definitely yep. a pioneer at the time. And obviously that's grown last year in particular is a tough year um, for many businesses. And it's, and it still is, you know, particularly in the U S and UK where, you know, COVID is, is pretty heavy, but, but everywhere in every country, businesses have had to move more to digital. What have you observed, say, from the period of when you, you started in 2008 or 2009 to, to this period of change or recession to global crisis in terms of health impact? What, what's been the trends, the differences, accelerations, the conversations you're having with business? How has that changed? Well, that's really what's driving this next book, because you have to think digital first. Without digital, how do you engage with your customer? There are examples of companies, I mean, early on with coronavirus, it's really about, you know, really getting back to the heart and the mission of your company. Why are you in business? You're, you're there to serve the world, serve society, serve your community in one way or another. You may not be able to acquire sales, but you can acquire customers, even in crisis. And there are times like an accordion there's going to be profitable years and there's going to be not so profitable years. So this is an not, not so profitable year, but it's a year that you need to survive, right? If you can provide help to your community, maybe they don't have a demand for your product. Maybe it's for other products that you can develop or introduce or create partnerships for. It's really all about the pivot. And as a social media marketer, man, there's no other profession that has to pivot as much as we do, right? I mean, I'm five years ago, we'd be talking about Google Plus. I'd be talking about StumbleUpon. And these are platforms that just don't exist today. And I think that a lot of businesses have been used to doing business for decades without having to change. So I think it was a eye open. It was a wake up call because at the end of the day, the consumer has always been digital. They've always been mobile first digital and companies have always been playing catch up. The bigger brands catch up faster. 
the more innovative startups out of Silicon Valley catch up really fast. But there's still a tremendous amount, especially small businesses that never thought digital first. They were never part of this whole digital revolution that everyone else was a part of. They were still investing marketing money in these old traditional methods that might might still drive some ROI, but they never even thought of these other new digital and, and social methods. So it, it's accelerated everything and it's caused businesses to pivot. And you know, I, I talk about my brother who is a winemaker. He does virtual wine tastings over Zoom now. Would have never thought about doing that a year, a year ago. Now it's actually opened him up to new markets he actually is doing it on behalf of HR organizations for Fortune 500 companies. So he's making great connections. And he knows that when we're out of this, he's going to be invited to do a lot of fiscal events. So I feel bad that businesses are, are suffering. But I also think that, you know, I was taught when they pulled the plug in my job after three and a half months, there's no guarantees in life, right? Mm -hmm. And you always have to be innovating. You always have to be thinking ahead. You always have to be thinking, what if? So for those companies that never had to do that, that never had a crisis, it was a great wake up call. And I think those that, that, that were savvy, innovative, that were able to pivot did. I know many companies that are doing just fine. My, my company did better financially last year than any other year, actually, in a weird way as more and more companies. And, and I'm assuming Digivisor did well as well because more companies needed to figure this out now. Uh, they had put it off for too long. And so therefore that is the number one thing that's really been impactful. You know, CEOs of especially a lot of small businesses, they might've poo-pooed some of this stuff before. And, and especially in B2B where they've always been a little bit late well, we do our trade shows. That's where we get our leads every year. Well, you can't do that now, right? And you can try to put on a Zoom webinar, but there are companies that have been doing it for 10 years that are much better generating leads, getting better speakers, having more compelling content. You know, so therefore, everybody's trying to accelerate a decade worth of figuring out digital into like a year, right? But I think companies are getting there. They're getting better. They understand now that it's not a matter of should we or should we not invest in this? It's how much should we invest? How much should we expect? And how do we improve our ROI over time? And the beautiful thing, like my brother, is once you start doing this virtually, the world is your oyster, right? Mm -hmm. If you're an Australian business, why can't you provide that service around the world? And as a fractional CMO, I mean, you know, one of my clients is in Japan, one is in Dubai, a few are in Los Angeles, but there are no limitations. And that's the wonderful thing about this. Once you tap into digital, it's truly scalable, you know, around the earth and it's scalable 24 seven. And it's just so powerful. And, you know, I wrote my book on influencer marketing because I think that's the type of marketing that so few companies really get and they misunderstand and they miss out on the opportunity. So for everybody listening whose business has not been doing as well, digital provides so many opportunities that uh, obviously Digivisor gives you visibility uh, <laughs> into how you're doing and, op and opens up the insight to allow you to do more. But th that's, that's definitely what's happened. It's definitely helped my business. Every digital marketer I know is very busy right now. It was a great year to be a digital marketer w within all the bad things that happened. It just pushes the need even more for digital. I mean, you're right that crisis kind of forces innovation and that, that speed. Did you, through your observations globally or, 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 or industry or size of company, see see it all the same? Did people move in the same pace or did some industries or size of organizations or countries pivot faster than others? Like what's your view of, of who kind of sees the moment better and who, who's late to the game in terms of, of just general terms? Yeah. I mean, I think consumer facing brands had to pivot very quickly. And one of the trends that I saw was they had to figure out a way to directly engage with the consumer. So, you know, DTC as a keyword has boomed over the last 12 months. And even, you know, one of my clients who primarily they're in the, uh, I guess you could call the, the fashion industry, they primarily sell through big retailers. They have also been, you know, forced into investing more into having their own direct online store presence mm -hmm. and doing more customer education events and doing more with a blog and with email marketing to try to increase the connection with, with the customer, right. And, and help them through and understand what their needs are. So yeah, the consumer facing brands is a no brainer, you know, B2B is always late, I believe in all this, but you know, we definitely see all of a sudden all these B2B companies and even B2C, wow, email marketing, you know, we need to start doing that. Um, <laughs> where have you been all along? Right. Or, Hey, we, we should, we should write some blog posts that really provide some value, some education for the customers or where have you been? Right. Or webinars where, you're not trying to sell something or a Facebook group that's just for your community of users to meet each other instead of you always pushing something. So um, I think the smart ones have, have you know, gravitated towards those areas. There's still many that are, you know, trying to figure this out. But, you know, normally I'd say, and I, I believe this is the same with influencer marketing as well, that the younger startup 
type of companies, they do not have a legacy marketing infrastructure to worry about. Mm -hmm. If they want to do 100% Instagram influencer marketing to drive business, they can do that. Much harder for more established company. So newer companies have that advantage. They don't have that, that luggage, that baggage that older companies have. And mm -hmm. that I think has worked to their advantage. So older, more established, you know, B2B, I'm going to say are slower. Um, and also when we think globally, I look at Japan as a country that never, the webinar culture never picked up there. And it's really forced. And I believe in digital and social media marketing, they're, they're very far behind, especially in B2B. And it's really forced them to play catch up. Mm -hmm. And they, they have accelerated quite a bit. And once again, you know, just like those companies that were very early on in social media marketing back in 2008, 2009, 2010, it's either an innovative, you know, person in charge. It's an executive that says, hey, we need to be doing this. Um, there's a driver internally. So mm -hmm. that's why I can't say it's a particular industry or particular country. It's does that driver exist in that company and have they been influencing decision making? That I think is mm -hmm. the key thing. Oh, that's interesting. I also liked your point earlier of the accordion that, that you know, you said there might be lighter years in terms of profitability to, to grade it, but this is the foundations you need to set. I, I love the example of your brother's business, like everything he's doing now will translate and he's just opened up his geographic border from where he might have originally been thinking. Um, talk us yeah. through your four... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just wanted to add on. I mean, yeah. you know, just a personal story. I do a lot of speaking and obviously... You know, there are some virtual speaking engagements I have, but it's, it's slowed down quite a bit, but I always did consulting. So, you know, even in my case, it's a pivot that says the speaking slowed down, but the consulting definitely increased. So it's a way of increasing my consulting and also investing, redoing my email marketing automations, uh, redoing my website, creating a lot more content for my SEO so that when we're out of this and I want to shift back to the speaking, I would have built that infrastructure. And that's been my advice for companies this is the time, if, you, if you're not busy with customers, this is the time to be busy internally and prepare that infrastructure for that next wave of business that will come. I love that you just addressed some owned, some earned and paid media are all in that in your website, you know, to because it's holistic, right? You want all these yeah. things to be working for you. Indeed. Um, I'd love to just the timing of your four books, like what the topics what drove you to write them at the time? And then we'll go in a bit deeper to this age of influence because I think that is a really interesting play and opportunity for organizations. Sure. You know, my books have always been customer driven. And uh, because I do a lot of speaking, I get a lot of interaction of what questions people ask and, and you know, what their interests are, what have you. So my first book was really, I, I translated my blog into a book and it was LinkedIn and it was people not understanding what we call open networking today of following someone you don't know on Twitter or connecting with someone on LinkedIn that you may not know that much, but they work at another company and you may want them as a mentor or you want to network with them. And back then it was very foreign. You're only connected with people that you, you, you've you shaken hands with. Uh, and people really miss out on this business tool. So, you know, I found, for instance, that uh, back in the early days of LinkedIn, the way the search algorithm worked was it was ranking people that would show up in people search by number of connections. So if I typed in, you know, Asian sales, marketing, VP, and someone did a keyword search for that. And I had more connections than anybody else with that keyword in my profile. I was showing up to be number one, right? Now, the algorithm has gotten a lot more sophisticated since then. <laughs> but but then, okay, well, you want to get more connected because that's where LinkedIn sees you as being more influential and therefore you get a higher search engine ranking. So it makes sense. Obviously, my advice changes over time, but it's one way of just looking at it as a tool. And when I wrote my second book, so that was 2009, my second book, uh, because my first book wasn't a business book. It was more like an online networking LinkedIn manual. And I really wanted to write a business book because I had launched my consultancy in January, 2010. So I actually had a Twitter book that was half done. And then I had an idea for a LinkedIn for uh, social selling. And well, it was really for sales and social media marketing. The term social selling didn't exist in 2011. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about employee advocacy, which didn't exist back in 2011 either. I used different words, but, but I ended up writing, I wanted to write the business book. I wrote that book. And then I had a chance to uh, work with a major publisher. I said, hey, I could write a book on LinkedIn. I could write the Twitter book, or I could write a book, which basically helps the reader create their own social media marketing strategy based on my consulting work. And they said, that's the book, write that. So that was Maximize Your Social in 2013. Um, in 2014, 15, I didn't write a book, but I had a lot of questions about technology. So I actually launched us an event called the Social Tool Summit where we had four events uh, over two years and we had companies like Digivisor come and speak on panels 
um, and let you know marketers know about all the wonderful technology and tools that existed. So fast forward to late 2018, it was actually a gentleman in Australia um, that reached out to me with basically a, a Kickstarter for authors. He's like, Neil, if you have an idea for a book, and I'm like, well, you know, um, I have this idea about influencer marketing. I haven't really blogged a lot about it, but it seems to be the question I get asked the most these days. So I wrote an outline, put it out there, and I received a few hundred orders. So it's like, okay, I better write the book now. Um, but as I was writing it and doing the research and doing interviews, I just realized how powerful of a medium it is. And since I've published the book, I mean, my thoughts have evolved even further. So um, to the point where I would argue that if you can make 100% of your organic social media content, user generated content, that is an ideal thing to do uh, for many reasons. And I know that for consumer facing brands that have a lot of customers on Instagram, it's going to be a lot easier than for B2B brands. Um, but I, I think that, you know, if you look at social media, not as a way to promote your company, but as a way to develop relationships and to engage with people, and it's sort of come, it, we've sort of gone full circle. I sort of come back to where PR drove social media, right? Um, because I think that there's a lot more value in the engagement and the relationships that you can generate, the business value, than in using social media purely as a promotional base, in which case we know the algorithms do not like you, will not show your content. And when it becomes pay to play, paid media, there's definitely value there, but it is an advertisement. One of my clients says, you know, we don't want to advertise on Instagram. It's going to make us look cheap. So there's a lot of different ways of thinking about paid media. I mean, a Google ad, I mean, that's sort of expected, you know, so that's a whole different, but um, social media, I just think is a different beast. And I think by looking at social media as this amazing place to collaborate with other people, with content creators, some more influential than other, with your customers, your employees, your followers, there's so much more value you can derive from that than going through the editorial calendar. Oh, you need to post to LinkedIn three times a day, Instagram twice a day and getting caught up in creating and publishing content that just wasn't built to perform well. So mm -hmm. that's a that's sort of a conclusion I've come to over the last year. And I've seen more and more companies that are starting to shift. We, we know more and more consumer brands are 100% user-generated content. And we have more and more companies that are saying, you know what, we're not gonna reach out to people we don't know just because they have a lot of followers. We're gonna create our own influencer networks of our fans, of our customers. Um, and you know, if, even if they're nano influencers, even if they only have a thousand followers, there's value in that. And there's trust in the community that they have. And there is value in the fact that they're content creators as well. And let's leverage their content. Let's leverage it on social. Let's leverage it for a paid media. Let's leverage it for a shopping cart, for a website. And that's tremendous value. Mm -hmm. And you know, the eye opener for me was I had a client that I helped with an influencer outreach campaign more, maybe four or five years ago. And it was to mommy bloggers and some of the creatives that these bloggers were creating for their blog were way better than anything this brand created for their website, right? And that, that to me was the eye-opener, like, wow, the level of creative is so intense that th there's more to collaboration than just having them publish your blog post. That really culminated in this book, The Age of Influence, and I've been sort of evangelizing since it published uh, literally 11 months ago. And just, you know, whether it's, it could be B2B, it could really be any industry, um, this value of collaborating with others to meet your different marketing objectives. Mm. I mean, I love the premise that the, like the heart of it is that the consumer is smart. They know what's authentic or not. Indeed. And then you have these great content creators who've actually be, you know, grown a following because they're great at telling stories and creating beautiful content or being entertaining if they're live, you know, Twitch influencers, et cetera. I mean, they're amazing, the amount of people that, that they can entertain live over long periods of time. But yeah, You know, I, I, I say that any brand could have become an influencer. Yeah. but they're not human yeah and and they're driven towards different metrics right so um yeah people rule social media they are the greatest content creators they are the greatest influencers the greatest engagers why would you not want to tap into that rather than trying to reinvent the wheel with something that just at its onset you're a logo you're not a person so you're, you're always at a disadvantage and i mean don't get me wrong there are things that, that brands can bring to social media but you know you, you need to have that sort of mindset and see every chance to engage with someone that's gonna talk about your brand as a golden opportunity. I, I would put up a slide of, of the tea ceremony in Japan of this once in a lifetime experience of engaging with someone, not knowing where that engagement's gonna go. You may not see them again. It may lead to something incredible, but that's, that is what I think social media holds for every brand. And it almost comes back to, are you doing social listening? Are you answering questions? Are you engaging with people when they follow you, when they send you a message? instead of just looking at how many clicks that we get, right? Mm. 
So I think, you know, the more companies have that mindset, I think the better the, their social media ROI becomes. I, I like uh, that you mentioned the measurement in there and including using influencers in your paid campaigns, because we've seen things like, you know, 30% greater engagement at a third less cost when it's Absolutely. an authentic person's genuine commentary, not pay for comment, which I think is different again. Absolutely. Um, so, so, so if you were just giving kind of, you know, top level advice, what does a great influencer program look like? Like what, what are those elements that a way a company could approach it? Well, I think the first thing is it's open to all. What this means is you have customers, certainly you can segregate them by followers, but it, it, a program is something where you want to bring together all of the ambassadors you have for your brand. And it, it's similar to, we have a big bank here in the United States called Bank of America. And they reached out to me the other day saying, hey, we, we have an advisory committee. We'd love for you to be on it. It's the, their own little community, but they're tapping into small business owners that they see as influential for their ideas and advice. So this is a, a B2B way of, of building your own influencer network. So I think it's really about reaching out to customers. I would say reach out to people that are digitally active. So look in your followers on any given platform, look at the people that engage with you, look at their digital footprint. You could set a minimum of like a thousand followers or if, if you wanted to and say, hey, you know, we're going to start a, a program to celebrate the fact that you're, you know, you talk about us, you follow us, that you're obviously a fan, you're a customer and uh, we want you to be part of it. And, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of different things that you can offer as part of this program. And, and then it gets into well, what, it, what what's in it for them and what's in it for you. So I think for you, obviously getting content, it should be uh, amazing ROI, whether or not the content amplification, I think is the icing on the cake. And I think brands used to look at it the other way around. Mm -hmm. But part of it is, you know, it's like the Las Vegas hotel where I talked to the director of marketing several years ago, you know, every influencer was reaching out to them for a free hotel room. And she was very savage. She goes, okay, I'll give you a free hotel room, but you're going to give me 50 static photos and 20 videos of 60 seconds that showcase our property, right? So they're going to get some content out of it that then, and, and a contract that says we can use this content anywhere we want mm -hmm. and we own the IP. Now that to me is smart. But I think it's really, you know, the whole idea about social media is word of mouth. If you're not inciting word of mouth, what's the sense of social media, right? So in order to incite word of mouth, you got to get people to talk about your product. And that's where I think these communities come in. So part of it might be giving them access to free product or regularly sending them product, knowing that they regularly publish content anyway. So, you know, those are other things. Uh, I was talking to a brand actually in Singapore, the Singaporean chain of a, a European consumer packaged goods brand that were looking to bring in other influencers to train their influencers. So they have this network of nano influencers, but you know, their copywriting could be a little bit better, or maybe their video work could be a little bit better. Why not actually hire your most influential person to come in and train all the other influencers on how to take a better photograph, how to shoot a better video or better copywriting, right? And, and then why wouldn't you also open this up to your employees, your employee advocacy? Hmm. And why wouldn't you open this up to outside people that may not be your customer yet, but maybe we can convert, convert them from an influencer into becoming an advocate. And so there are case studies of companies that have done this and they, you know, and there are tools now where you can upload your, your Instagram followers, your email database and your shopping cart history and find hidden influencers. And that customer I was talking about in the fashion industry, they found some verified Instagram profiles um, just because whenever you log into a profile, you use an email address and that same email address in their customer database was used by a few people that had six figure followers on Instagram, verified profiles, right? And now they can reach it to reach out to say, we know you're our customer. We want to take this, you know, we want you to be part of our VIP brand ambassador program or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. I, I think those are some of the elements. I think training and offering education, especially for, for the employees as a definite plus, but even for influencers, giving them access, not just a product to experience. There used to be a lot of travel experiences back in the day, and a lot in Australia, actually, uh, you know, that, that day will come back. It's all comes down to what's in it for me. And there are so many brands that do this so bad because they just assume that, hey, we're going to send you a $100 gift card where maybe $100 isn't worth my time. But if you say, we'll send you, you know, free product for a year and we're going to let you, you know, um, we're going to sign you up for a monthly webinar, giving you men's grooming tips from leading fashion models on GQ Mag. I mean, I don't know, right? Whatever it is, but brands have tremendous assets tremendous IP that they can 
provide as an incentive for people to want to become part of this program to create content to talk about them in social. And at the end of the day, these people are very tapped into what people are talking about on social as well. So as a user focus group, I think they become important. For crisis management, you now have your own little army of, of nano influencers you can tap into for help. So they, they become, I believe, an essential, you know, an essential part of, of marketing really for any company. Any company should be having an influencer network, however small or large, with a lot of these different facets that I talked about. I love that you talked about that broader ecosystem. I think some people have mistaken in the past the influencer as the the kind of paid for comment, whereas what you're talking about yep. is genuine love of the brand, a, a win for everyone, the, the the end audience, them themselves, um, a longer term view, and and a hierarchy in there, right? Maybe those that you don't know, oh, absolutely, some little fans, your employees. You you really brought that together brilliantly. Who do you think is doing this very well? You gave a, a couple of examples of the, the fashion company and the Bank of America even reaching out to you is probably an example of that. But who do you think is doing this well? Well, there's a lot of, well, I guess I wouldn't say a lot of case studies, but there are more and more. But there's one that I bring up. It's a company called Rosefeld. They're a watch company. And um, I think they're out of Amsterdam, but they have another headquarter in New York City. But they're ones that did exactly what I talked about and created this inclusive community and have found that influencer referred business that part of it is you could also give people in your community a discount code. And if people buy from that, there might be a little bit of a commission. For some people, it's just being able to offer a discount code to their community that doesn't exist anywhere else is huge. So um, they found, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they found you know an increase in uh, in ROI and, and uh, website traffic and all the other things you would associate with a successful program. So I think, you know, when I wrote The Age of Influence, it, it published in March of 2020. It was primarily written in 2019. The concept was still new. Even that case study did not make my book because I didn't find out about it until after I wrote it and I was preparing for Social Media Marketing World in San Diego in, in March, right before the lockdown. Um, and since then, this year, or I should say in 2020, when I've talked to influence marketing agencies, influence marketing tools, brands, there's now been this interest in creating their own internal influencer network or internal brand ambassador network. So I think we're just seeing the beginning of it, meaning that you're not too late if you're just listening to this and you're trying to figure this out. But the key thing really is what's in it for me. Why would they want to join? What is the incentive? There's so many things that brands can provide them. It's crazy once you look at it. So I encourage everyone listening uh, to, you know, it, it, it takes some time. Um, if you have internal communications people, it could be your PR people. Um, it's not a one-to-many marketing uh, effort. It's a one-to-one -one PR effort. It's an influencer relation effort of reaching out to these people, having conversations, seeing how you can help them and welcoming them to the community when then you can go one-to-many. So it is very much built on developing relationships, but you know these relationships pay gold dividends once you create them. Then you have people that talk about your brand and social without you having to ask them. And that's the difference. If you reach out to someone that's never heard of your brand, it's going to be one-time transactional. When you reach out to people that already use your product, I mean, they would love to help you. They're, they're already fans. Um, and they're going to go head over heels to talk about you whenever they have the opportunity to do so. And you, you also gave the example, and I have seen this in action very successfully, is when they defend a brand in a situation, in a crisis, um, it can be Absolutely. one of the best things that you've built that really shows it value, its value at that point. Coming back to kind of where, where you know, you yourself had naturally gone to when you first book helping executives understand LinkedIn, what do you think a C-level executive should be doing or what does best practice look like in terms of their engagement with social and where do they fit in that influence ecosystem? Yeah. When I look at who should be the influencers inside a company, really the CEO should be, is the most influential person and therefore should have the most digital influence. It rarely works that way. Tesla, Elon Musk, Richard Branson version. I mean, there are a few outliers, but for the most part, I think executives have, have steered clear or kept very minimal. I mean, I'm working with a client right now, helping the company with a strategic initiative, but also helping the CEO. And really the CEO knows that if he has a podcast, if he's doing live streaming, if he's blogging, if he's showing up on social media every day, he creates the role model that everyone else inside the organization is going to emulate. And he wants to activate his employees. 
So if, if you on the top can do this now, you know, I, I once worked with another company it was actually an agency in Japan and they primarily sold to foreign equity companies, uh, B2B companies. They were trying to reach out to B2B headquarters and American companies, European countries. And, you know, maybe their salesperson was trying to connect with people on LinkedIn. But when the CEO reaches out saying, hey, we serve your industry. We work with a lot of companies in your industry. Let's stay connected. That itself was an amazing lead generation device because everybody wanted to tap into the experience and the knowledge that the CEO had. So, you know, if the CEO shares content on social media, people listen. It's, it's just not the same when you look at the title of the person that's publishing or posting the content. It's just not the same when it comes from a CEO compared to anyone else in the organization. So yeah, the CEO should be the biggest cheerleader digitally. And the CEOs also have the less amount of time to invest. So there are ways of, you know, I know a lot of CEOs where their internal PR people manage things for them. As long as it's your authentic voice going out there, you know, it's totally okay to have other people there. Two thirds of books I hear are ghostwritten. Presidents have their speeches ghostwritten. So it's okay. But I think you should be out there. You should be present. And the more present you are, the more benefits it has for all these, whether it's your employees looking at you as a role model or the way that you can engage with others that, that other internal employees can't because of your title. It's just, it, it's a no brainer that you should be the biggest cheerleader for your company in social media. And because we're a fan of insights, we know that people are 14 times more likely to share their CEO's messaging than the brand. So why wouldn't you do it for that reason alone in their organizations? Um, just on insights, how important do you think measurement and insights are to social marketing, social media marketing? And is this a specialist function or everyone needs to be involved, including the CEO and understanding its footprint? Like, What's your view on where it fits? Yeah. So when I wrote my book, Maximize Your Soul Show was based on all this social media marketing consulting. And when I began consulting, I realized that I was basically creating strategies and I needed a framework. So I went back into my experience in Japan. And in Japan, there's uh, someone named Dr. Edwards Deming. I don't know if you've ever heard of the name before. He's an American professor. He's known as the godfather of quality control. So the Toyota, you know, Kanban system and, you know, the Sonys and the Panasonics being able to mass produce at, at a low cost. It was really all owed to the teachings of Dr. Edwards Deming, who's better known in Japan than in the United States. So when I was in my third year at this, uh, at working at the semiconductor company, we all had to go through this training and the training, including the training included what's called, uh, the Deming circle or the PDCA circle and how to apply it to your job. And basically what professor Deming's did was in an experiment, there's a way to run it. That's going to be optimal. You first plan the experiment. You do the experiment based on your plan, you check your actions. And then A is you act upon what you saw and you optimize and it's never ending circle Kaizen. And immediately I thought, well, social media is one big experiment. You don't know how well you're performing until you start doing it right. And then you get data and you learn from the insights you optimize and it's this PDCA circle. So that became the center. In fact, the name of my brand in Japan is called PDCA social because it's something that every Japanese marketer gets. And they also, in, in the U S we'd call that data driven, right? So Every company I work with, the strategy begins with the objective, right? But how do we, you know, what does an objective look like in terms of a number? Because if we can create a number, a metric, a KPI out of that, my number one goal for you is to help you reach that metric. And whatever we do has to support that, right? And it just makes a very, very clean way of looking at your marketing, your operations. And along the way, you learn so much through the insight, the data really leads you the data really informs you what you need to do next. And, and therefore, with every one of my clients, that's one of the first things we do is how are we going to measure our success? What are we looking at? And, you know, I haven't used Digivisor before. I'm excited to get, get going on it because I've yet to find a tool to really help me map all that out. In fact, when I did that social tool summit, I asked, you know, uh, the room of like 100 different marketing executives, what is the number one tool you use to measure your social media marketing ROI? What do you think the overwhelming majority answer was? something called Excel. <laughs> yeah. Right. I was going to, I was going to say <laughs> someone going in tab by tab, trying to pull it together into something it, else. Right. <laughs> it, exactly. So yeah. I end up really, uh, you know, creating custom dashboards for every one of my clients in terms of how we measure this. And, um, yeah, and it's amazing because it's like one of my first customers, we want to do Facebook ads. Like, well, let's also try Twitter ads and Twitter ads cost per conversion way lower than Facebook. In fact, we had a higher quality conversion on Twitter versus Facebook. But if you're just going on a motion, you don't know that. 
until you experiment, you get the data, you look at the data and you act upon it. It's this PDCA where you're getting better and better results over time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, metrics is everything. Everything, and Professor Edwards Demi Nassau has a very famous quote. If you don't, if you can't explain what you're doing, if you can't measure what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing, right? So if you don't have a process for what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. So everything should be process oriented and data driven. I mean, there are creative aspects to this, don't get me wrong, but a lot of this should be humming along like a factory. But there have to be smart people looking at the data. Data analysis could be a unique role. I think that it's something that everybody, just like executives throughout the organization need to get social media today. People in HR need to get it, legal people. Uh, I, I teach at universities where people from R&D show up wanting to learn about social media. They're monitoring and looking for new product ideas. So I think that sort of data insight is a skill that everybody needs to have. And what I love is when I work with CEOs and teach them and then the marketing people will report to them and then the CEO will go well, away. What, you know, what's our click-through rate? And, and the marketing people are freaked out because they've never been challenged. It's always been marketers held all the KPIs and nobody understood what they were talking about, but the graphs look good. They were going up. Uh, everybody should be informed and everybody should determine the networks and everybody should have ownership in them and try to make them successful. I think that's an ideal organization. Neil, I couldn't say any of that better, but literally that is the, the hymn book that I sing from. Uh, so that's amazing. <laughs> Where can listeners find out more about you or to buy your books? What, what can they do? Where do they go? Well, my name is Neil Schaefer. I am the real Neil. So it's spelled N-E-A-L. Uh, the last name is S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R. So I'm Neil Schaefer everywhere on social. My website is neilschaefer.com. The name of my book is The Age of Influence. It's for sale wherever fine books are sold, online or offline. And I also have my own podcast for those of you that want to dig deeper into this concept of digital influence. It's called the Maximize Your Social Influence podcast. Fantastic. Thank you, Neil. Now we're going to go to some rapid fire one minute questions. Um, what is your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure is playing a game called Clash Royale. <laughs> <laughs> and I played it because my son played it. He got me into it. So it actually helps me bond with my son in a weird way, but it's still a guilty pleasure. <laughs> to be honest, any kid that's gaming is building the skills that they need in yeah. the, the future workforce. So uh, I, I think that's great. Um, what brand or brands inspire you and why? <sighs> really great question. You know, I'd say historically, Apple has been this brand that's inspired me. And I, you know, it just, when I used to present, I had a picture of Steve Jobs holding an iPhone. Nobody, there was no data that led them to make that. There, there was this intuition that people needed this, that they would create a new market with this. And, and that is truly inspiring, right? And I think that mm -hmm. uh, there's so many copycats out there. You know, I, I challenge businesses to use the same sort of PDCA and experimentation with products as Apple has done. I mean, they put out some things that sold well and they've, you know, the Apple Newton and other things that just haven't gone well. Um, so I think having that sort of entrepreneurial spirit in a brand is what I like to see. Good answer. And if you could pick an age that you could stay for the rest of your life, what age would that be and why? Wow. Boy, it could go either way, huh? It could be young when you had nothing to worry about and just have fun all the time, or you're older, you're, you're more experienced. You know, I try to live a life of no regrets. So I'd say I would want to be who I am today um, with all the knowledge and experience I have and, and uh, doing my own PDCA on my own life uh, and my own business and with my own relationships. So I'm going to, I'm going to go for now. You'll get, you'll get a big tick from your wife and your kids, right? From her, having that answer. Good answer, dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all that we have time for today, Neil. It's been fascinating and, you know, just so rich in the insights that you gave, particularly because I think people have heard influencer programs or engage influence, but haven't unpacked it. You've talked about B2B and B2C examples and also that it's not too late to think about it. So get uh, buy your book and make sure that they learn how to do it. Yeah, so you thank know, I'll, you. I'll leave a lasting thought. If you can take the money that you invest in paid media and invest it in people, invest it in people who are actually buying your products, who work for your company, who spend their time to engage with, think of the ROI that you can glean from that. So I think as marketers, we get lost in the digits, the numbers, the money, but, you know, there are some really, really powerful things you can do when you shift your spend to other areas. So I just want to throw that out there um, as something to think about uh, as people ponder what they should do next after listening to this episode. 
And to your point, have a hypothesis, put it to test, measure it, see what you can learn. And uh, you will be proven right, no doubt. Um, thank you again. Thank you. This podcast is hosted by Digivisor and I'm Emma LaRusso. Bye for now.